Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We're so glad you're here. It's another more than the score season. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. And it's a pleasure to welcome you back to More Than the Score and into this absolutely beautiful building, the Data Science Building here at the University of Virginia. Those that are present this morning will get to take a tour, a um, self-guided tour throughout the building. Um, and our dean will talk to you in a little bit and tell you a little bit more about the building, but welcome. We also want to welcome our at-home audience that are, they've tuned in from around the world. Uh, welcome, we're glad you're here this morning. Special thanks to Jennifer Bowler, Stephanie Fentress, Sunny Taylor, and the entire data science uh, school for helping us and, and preparing us to be here this morning. We're out of place, right? We're normally at Alumni Hall, so we're, we're really delighted to be here. Also, special thanks to the Lifetime Learning team. They work behind the scenes to make this program happen uh, each and every Saturday before the home football game. Also, our partners, the Alumni Association, we uh, shout out to you this morning. We are thrilled to welcome Phil Bourne, the Dean of the Data Science uh, School, to speak with us this morning. Go ahead and give him a nice, warm, more than a score welcome. Also, if you want to learn more about the uh, More Than a Score list for the season and other um, lectures coming up, other uh, our podcasts, podcasts, and blogs, go to engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Um, all right, before we begin, go ahead and silence the ringer on your phones. Go ahead and power it down and be here now. Um, there, there will be a handheld microphone that will be brought around to you should you have a question this morning. Um, and we ask that you hold your questions to the end of the presentation. Um, and when you're asking that question, go ahead and state your, your name and your UVA affiliation. Now, allow me to introduce our, our speaker for the morning. Philip E. Bourne is the Stevenson Founding Dean of the School of Data Science and the Professor of Data, Data Science and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Virginia. Prior to this appointment, he was the Associate Director for Data Science for the National Institutes of Health and a Senior Investigator at the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Bourne has published over 350 papers and five books. Uh, which have garnered over 86,000 citations. He's also a uh, co-founder of four companies. His awards include the Jim Gray eScience Award, the Benjamin Franklin Award, and et cetera. Bourne's current uh, research focuses on data science, methods including artificial intelligence, applied to systems, pharmacology, structural bioinformatics, and scholarly communication. As Dean of the School of Data Science, Bourne is leading an effort to create a new kind of school, a school without walls, guided by common goals to further discovery, sheer knowledge, and positively impact society. Uh, Dean Bourne, thank you for welcoming us into your beautiful new building, and thanks for speaking at More Than the Score this morning. Dean Bourne. That was a very good start, I have to say. <laughs> uh, and I haven't been drinking, I promise. Um, well, thank you very much for being here. I always feel when I, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I always feel after an introduction like that, everything is going to go downhill pretty seriously. But we'll do our best to keep things alive. Who here is a Richmond supporter? Uh, all right, in that case, we can continue. All right. Um, so let me, I just want to, let me say, oh, there we are. We're talking about how data has driven societal change. The fact is we now have a school of data science. We have a science to study data. We have a whole building to do it in. We have you know, many students now across undergraduate and graduate programs doing just that. So there's something going on here. And the question is, how big is it? What kind of change is it going to produce? That's the kind of thing we're going to, and it's obviously already happening to some extent, how much more is going to happen and, and what, what's the progression here. So we're going to talk a bit about that, but I, I don't want to do all the talking. I'm in the mode now that death by PowerPoint is the worst thing that can happen. Students just won't accept it. 
they, they want to have a dialogue with the audience. So I, I definitely want to have that with you. So even though it was said, hold questions to the end. Don't. If you've got something on your, <laughs> if you've got something on your mind, if you're disagreeing, even better if you're agreeing, but if you're disagreeing, uh, just yell out and uh, we'll take it from there. And if it gets too rowdy, which uh, we'll, 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 we'll come up with a new plan. So how many people here have used DALI or other tools to generate images? For the benefit of the thousands of people on the streaming, uh, that was a, a small handful in the, in the audience here. Um, anyone want to guess what this is? So I, got, I, I used DALI, which is one of these tools, to uh, generate an image. Do you, any idea what it's supposed to be? I, I can't hear, sorry. Bedlam? Oh, no. So uh, it's actually meant to be Prometheus. And it's a, the question is, for you, is are we in a Promethean moment? So the context being, if you know your mythology, which I don't know very well, but uh, I can use ChatGPT to look it up like everybody else. Uh, <laughs> It's basically the notion that Prometheus gave fire, took, stole fire from the gods and gave it to the common people. And it's come to be, represent some major change uh, that was brought about. And so the question I have for you, we'll do a show of hands, how many think that this whole data revolution, which includes, we'll talk about the relationship between data and AI in a minute, but I'm bundling these things together. How many think that it is a Promethean moment, a fundamental change? Wow, actually, more, at least I'd say somewhere between a third and a half. So who doesn't? One person. So the, re <laughs> <laughs> so the rest are obviously not awake yet. Uh, and the rest of you, of course, are at home in your pajamas. I hope you're putting your hands up. Um, well, I personally think it is such a moment, but of course I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid in, in terms of... Uh, and I, I, the reason I say that is primarily by looking in the eyes of students who are desperate to study this stuff because they realise that this is so much of the future. So much of the future and dealing with societal problems is going to revolve around how we uh, analyse data. And so uh, it's, you know, they're, they're very much into it. And, uh, we're doing what we can to help them along. So what, what are we talking about here? And I could go into a whole spiel about the interface between statistics and applied mathematics and computer science and applied to different fields, but it's much better to try and tell you what data science is with a story. So I was sitting in my, before we had this beautiful building, I was in the Dell. Do you know where the Dell is? The, the, those red sheds? My office used to be uh, where they keep the lawnmowers. Where they, not, not, the lawnmowers had gone when I actually got there, but, um, which was strange because I had this wonderful corner office in building one at NIH and I suddenly moved to this 90 square foot tin shed built office. But anyway, that's all irrelevant. Um, but Th Thomas Hart came to see me. He just knocks on the door and I didn't know who he was. And he said, uh, can I talk to you about something? And I said, yeah, sure, what, what's up? And he said, well, I'm actually a, a physician here in the health system, and I, I, mean, I, treat, I do trauma treatments. And quite often those traumas are a result of car crashes. And what happens is, you know, someone comes in, they've had a car crash, uh, essentially we, we scan them looking for internal injuries. Occasionally they die in the scanner as we're doing that, depending on the nature of the, of the condition. Uh, sorry for the little kids up there. Um, and so, but he said, but I also noticed if they recover and I talk to them, I actually have come to note a correlation between the type of internal injury they have and the kind of crash they've had, whether it's a head-on collision, a rollover, rear-ending, whatever it might be. He said, I got interested enough in this to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and ask them for the public crash data, which they have, the state is public. First of all, this is a year or two ago. Things have got a lot better, I have to say. But just to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, I mean, you deserve a medal for that. <laughs> uh, so I was impressed straight away. And he said, of course, then I also have access to uh, the electronic health record. 
And I've started to try and understand these correlations. And I said, you know, where, what's go where are you? He said, I'm stuck. I can't tell whether there's statistical significance here. And I said, well, what you, if, if there is, what are you going to do with that information? He says, well, the idea is that the first responders will send uh, an image of the crash to the ER, the emergency room, and then they will know, based on these correlations, where to look for internal injuries first based on this relationship. And we might save lives. I thought, that is data science. Right? So the basic notion is we're actually bringing disparate data sets together. Who would have actually thought about bringing transport data and crash data together with an electronic health record? So that's the kind of thing we do here every day. Right? And we want to do it for societal benefit. And this is certainly an example of potential societal benefit. So that's, that's what we're about here. He went on to do a uh, master's in data. He already had an MD. Uh, was, you know, been out practicing for some time. I also realized this morning this slide's a little out of date. He's now an associate professor. I've talked about him so much, I think that's what's <laughs> elevated. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so I think that's just a, you know, we've got, this, got lots of stories like that. And I'd love to tell you more. So the question is, how disruptive, you've all agreed that there's a level of disruption here. So how disruptive will it be? So, there's a fellow called Peter Yamantas, who is a sort of philosopher, futurist, um, and he ca has come up with this thing he calls the six Ds. And it's all about exponential growth. That's an exponential growth curve over time against, in this case, the amount of data, which we use to describe this, the, the Vs that are used to describe data. There's volume, velocity, which is how quickly it's coming, and the variety, which is the kind of types of data I just described. So, what are, the, what are other Vs that describe data? Veracity, very good. That was the one I was thinking of. I only say that because you said it. <laughs> uh, others? Validity, oh, that's a good one. We should come back to that. Uh, how valid is the, is the data? Uh, the, these are uh, fundamental questions, some of, uh, some of which were asked by you or others that were uh, given to me, and we're going to get to that at the end, along with whatever you might want to bring up. So anyway, getting back to this, so here's the exponential growth curve. The six Ds start with digitization. This is what is driving everything. And we'll see, I'll say a little more about why that's happening in a minute, and some of it I'm sure is obvious to you. But digitization of, uh, you know, is, allows us to manipulate data. It's, we're not talking about things in notebooks anymore. When I started doing things, in my, my background's in biomedicine. When I started doing things uh, in, in medical informatics, it was, everything was on paper. The charts were on paper. Everything was on paper. And it was one, essentially one copy, one backup copy. Uh, now, of course, which of course took forever to move from one department to another. Now all of that's instantaneous. So you can see why all these things are starting to change. But then, as the amount of digital data grows, there's this deceptive phase. I'm going to give you an example of this in a minute. And because it, even though it's growing exponentially, it's, looking, it's still low on that exponential curve. It's doubling in a certain time period, but it's still doing so fairly slowly. Then suddenly you reach an inflection point where a disruption occurs. In, in whatever it is, and we'll give you an example. And then other things can happen, things I actually like. Demonetization, dematerialization, and democratization. So that's, that's a bit nebulous, so let's, 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 let's put an example on it. So a real case study is Kodak. Right? I know, I'm sure some of you in the audience are old enough to remember way back when, including me, of course. Uh, but Kodak effectively invented the digital camera. It was the size of a suitcase, but it was, they, they invented it. But what they decided is that they would, put, they would shelve it because it, they, all their money was being made from the chemical business, selling the chemicals and so on, and the film, of course, associated with analog uh, photography. 
And they didn't worry about it for a while during this deceptive phase because they didn't think things were growing too fast. Meanwhile, companies all over the place, uh, in Europe and, and Japan in particular, were actually developing digital cameras. The first one I had cost $800 and was one megapixel. And now, of course, well, yeah, what can I say? I'm going to use this again in a minute. But uh, OK, so then what happened is the film market collapsed. Effectively, Kodak went bankrupt, filed Chapter 9. And then some weird things happened. First of all, cameras got replaced, which no one necessarily predicted. This is the key, right? When, when this started happening, and I started a company around sharing digital ph photographs, the idea that we could, this was kind of like the shoebox full of photographs, but it was going to be online, it sounds so lame now because everybody's doing it. But at the time, you know, 15, 20 years ago, this was a big deal. But none of us actually predicted that there would be phones on cameras because that hadn't actually happened yet. But it came along, obviously. But that, then what happened, of course, is this demonetization. Suddenly, the cost of producing a photograph essentially drops to zero. And then dematerialization, there is no material. It's just a bunch of bits and bytes. And then democratization, which is something we'll say a little more about in a bit, but took place, which means everybody could do it, everybody could share it, and, and uh, you know, it was a, a completely different world. And as a result of that, Instagram, TikTok, and so on, became more valuable than Kodak ever was, and the market had completely changed. That's disruption, right? But, and it started with digitization. So I gave a talk about this to the leadership of the university uh, a, little, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, actually more than that now, probably three months ago, and I basically applied this to the notion of higher ed and what could and might happen at UVA, as well as other places, of course. So that looks a bit like this. So you've got digitized the same uh, aspects, but you've got AI, the AI impact is minimal. Right? And I can tell you that's exactly how the university thought. I, try, I tried to tell the, uh, the president and provost what was coming in 2017 vis-a-vis -vis AI. There was a paper came out on transformers. It doesn't matter the details of that, except it's the T of chat GPT and it was fun a fundamental breakthrough. That subsequently led to, you know, five years later, knee-jerk reactions when ChatGTPT comes out, uh, and suddenly the university is forming task force to deal with all this. But we should have been on top of it five years to, uh, before that. More to say about that in a minute. But then there's other things happening that are not necessarily tied to the data directly, but are actually going to have fundamental impact. How many people here have heard of quantum computing? Oh, just about everybody. Good. How many people want to tell me what it is? <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things I ask 10 people to get 10 different answers, but they're all, they're all good. What can I say? Um, all, all, the only point to say here is this is another, potentially another major disruption that's on the horizon. First of all, in principle, quantum computing can actually decrypt every encryption system that currently exists in the world, uh, in effectively in, in, not real time, but in, in, in reasonable time. This, is, you know, this, is, this could be a fundamental disruption, right? So that obviously means we have to do you know, uh, homomorphic uh, encryption and all these kind of other th uh, initiatives that are going on as well. And then, so these are other things that are happening in the same time that the data is going crazy. So, uh, augmented reality, I'll say more about that. Uh, models reach human capacity. So you're, you're now all familiar with these large language models, including ChatGPT. They, if you play around with them, I don't think most people would say that they've reached human capacity by a long shot yet. But potentially they will, and I'll, I'll explain a little more about that in a minute. And then, of course, what, what effect does that have on the university? Well, research, suddenly, you go to a conference now, it doesn't matter what field you're in, two-thirds of the papers are using large language models or some AI. It's, it's, it's a game changer for how we think about research. Right? I'll give you just a, a really trivial example that just reflects a number of things. So I'm, I'm involved with uh, something called the Jackson Labs. The Jackson Labs breeds mice. 
They can breed, there's 23,000 genes in a mouse. They can actually breed a mouse that has any combination of those genes that, that will live. And that obviously has, are used in medical experiments. What they used to do is they would actually make a genetic modification and then to understand the phenotype, how that changed the mouse, either in whatever way, they would actually then have someone standing there with a clipboard uh, looking at it in a cage. Right? It turns out how mouse, mouse, mouses, mice uh, actually preen their whiskers is a real behavioral trait that's actually affected by their genetic makeup. It's just an example. So, but now what happens is suddenly, instead of having someone with a clipboard, you now have streaming video of that mouse at every moment of its life being captured and the correlation between these effects being measured much more, in much more detail just by virtue of the fact we have the ability to do it and store that and analyze that data. It's just a trivial example. People, I'll give you a much more profound example of it, the effect on science. But this is just an example that really is just, you wouldn't even think about. So it really, it just means that it, it, it also displaces someone from doing a job. That's, that's a question that we'll come back to. But uh, anyway, that's a little digression. Uh, learning modalities change. I'll give you an example of that in a second. Uh, knowledge workers must adapt. Uh, and, you know, this is before we even get to robotics. I mean, we obviously have a lot of robotics already. There's a robotic arm out here you can look at. But uh, this, you know, in terms of price point and lots of other things, we're not quite there yet beyond what obviously what happens in manufacturing and places. All this leads to job market shift. And uh, the, the question is, how will this, if, this, if you believe that this is a disruption, remember I was addressing the, uh, the leadership of the university with this, is what does UVA look like and in what time frame? So everyone's thinking, oh, yeah, well, okay, well, well, let me think. So what did I do? I asked uh, Dali to actually generate a couple of images of what the future of you, and I got these two. So this is the sort of dystopian view. Uh, and this, is, this was just generated automatically by saying, give me a dystopian view of the future of UVA. That was it. And then, you know, I think even I would want to live on the lawn in, in, on the picture on the right there. Uh, the academical village has taken on a whole new thing. And as I was looking at this this morning, I realized that the, the, clearly the impetus for this uh, is the learning that went into this image had something to do with existing imagery of UVA. Because I, 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 I would guess, because if you look at that silo, it's very much like the silos that we have by, by the railway line uh, on, the, uh, on, on West Main Street. So, I, and of course, then the background of uh, the Blue Ridge and so on. So, you know, that, so this, so this you know, ooh, okay, which, which is it going to be? Which one do you want? Uh, anyway, I, I, was, you, I was doing all this to get money out of the president. I'll get, I'll, <laughs> I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, and then, and then I asked my son, I asked my son, uh, I didn't show this to the president, I have to say. <laughs> my son at the time was working for Industrial Light and Magic in London. Uh, and as you know, they, they do a lot of stuff for the movies. They're founded by George Lucas, and it's kind of the animation studio. Um, and I asked him to generate an image of what, what his thought was. So this wasn't done with AI. This was done by a human. Uh, so, but you know, this, you make of it what you will. I want to say something else about, uh, I'll get to this, but don't, let me not tell you about the model of the school that's upstairs, which I want you to look at while you're here, because uh, it relates to this. And it's all about the human in the loop, which we're going to get to in a minute. But let's just, you know, let's just look at the favorite example and just sort of, let's just break it down a bit. This is not in any way a technical talk. This is just, you know, just to get a sense of what's going on. I think, I don't know what you feel about these large language models, but the, so chat GPT, the G is for generative. And I think the, the thing that really has got to everybody, uh, including our leadership, was the notion that it's generating language in a way that looks pretty reasonable. 
Alan Turing developed many years ago a thing called the Turing test, which is where you would, you know, you would have either a human or a computer behind a screen, and you would be interacting with it, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between one and the other. We passed that a long time ago. And generative uh, AI is really a step even beyond all of that. The P of chat GPT refers to pre-train, which is unsupervised learning on vast amounts of data, in fact, the whole of the internet. And as you know, there's a lot of controversy about using copyrighted content uh, to actually be, uh, which is part of these models. And then the training is done on uh, neural networks that effectively uh, mimic the brain's function. And, I, and then I mentioned the T for transformers before, but it's really something that enables this, treats text as tokens and allows for parallel computation. So it's just a way of allowing all this to happen in a, in a, a way that's really uh, you know, in a time frame. Of course, it uses a huge amount of compute resources, but in a time frame that allows, uh, allows this to, to actually to work effectively. So it was a huge breakthrough. So how do we get there? So partly, as I've been emphasizing all along, and why this school exists, is the amount of data. And I don't think we even really think about that at all. But just the amount of data is doubling about every two years. And it's, it has a huge impact on all of us. And I was thinking, I've actually written a memoir about the whole, how data has affected my life over 50 years or so. And I, in 1995, I went to the San Diego Supercomputer Center because I felt that was the best place to do scientific computing in this country. They had these powerful computers that were shared across the nation. So I went and looked at the computer I was look, using back then, just not, not that long ago, and I suddenly realized, now this comes again, that that computer, which was one of the most powerful computers in the United States, that was used by scientists across the country, was about one thousandth the power of one iPhone. And that's happened, you know, since, in what, 30 years? So this, all of this is just fundamentally changing. And it allows us to actually uh, process large amounts of data. And the, the CPU versus GPUs, so if you, if you have uh, a video stock, you know that uh, well, the power of GPUs. But uh, you know, they were originally developed for the gaming industry, but now they turn out to be very useful for this kind of neural net and AI work. And so uh, that's, that's been a major uh, change. And then, you know, there's been some advances, but neural networks have been around for like 30 or 40 years. So it's really the amount of data that uh, is, is the fundamental shift. So where, where are we then? Where does this sit relative to what is potentially possible? So. The current, so there's a fellow I worked with a bit when I was in San Diego, uh, I was at UC San Diego for over 20 years, uh, Terry Sanowski. He's both a computer scientist uh, and a neuroscientist. And he wrote this paper, you can look it up, um, that uh, essentially says that currently the, the biggest network, neural networks we have, the most powerful learning, machine learning models, are about as powerful or equivalent to one rice grain size of the cerebral cortex. So we aren't even beginning to anywhere near tap the power of the human brain by these models yet. And of course, there are other morphologies in the brain as well that do a whole lot of other things that we're not even touching here. But the point is, it's still a long way to go, but there could be some pretty, uh, and this is just going to advance and advance. So what does this mean in practical terms uh, with AI and data? So uh, this has sort of came up. Uh, uh, Jim Ryan, the president, asked me that after I gave this you know, dystopic talk about you know, what, what, do we, what does it mean in practice? You know, is, is this just Phil Bourne going nuts, or is there something here? So basically, I, he said, give me some examples. So the first example, I, I said, what's, what's UVA going to be like in five to 10 years? Well, so let's just assume that you're studying history. Right? I'm a history major. Um, and now what do I do? I'm, what am I studying? Well, of course, I'm studying Thomas Jefferson. Right? 
Uh, and as I study Thomas Jefferson, and I go to uh, the Special Collections Library, there's a lot of materials online, I might go to Monticello, um, you know, and I'm doing all this, and what will I do in five years? Well, a lot of the materials that are still not digitized will be by virtue of that growth curve we saw in digital data. And so there'll be less and less reason to go to somewhere else to get that. But there's going to be more and more reason to look at it in different ways. So using augmented reality, I'm going to be studying Thomas Jefferson. I'm almost guaranteed this is going to happen because it's, some of this is already happening in places. And what do I want to do? Well, I've got, I've, this, I've generated, by virtue of the ability to process language, I've actually created a social network of Thomas Jefferson automatically. So all this text tells me where Jefferson was at a certain point in his life, who he was talking to, da 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 da, da right? So, but now I can do this automatically. In an afternoon on a laptop, I can generate a timeline of Thomas Jefferson's life. And it's going to look something like this. Uh, and then I'm, I'm moving in my virtual reality headset. I'm moving along. And it's like, OK, oh, let me stop here. And what am I stopping at? 19, 1817, the laying of the cornerstone of the University of Virginia. And I, all right, this is good. Who's here? Oh, Madison and Monroe are here. Let me have a chat. Let me have a chat, GPT chat. <laughs> so I play a conversation with those presidents. I could role play Madison, I could role play Monroe. And then I look around in the same way that I showed you the pictures that my son's generated. He also generated an, ac an academical village picture. What did that look like at different time points? This is actually taken from a lithograph. This is not the one he did. But you can do this. So suddenly, I'm standing there with Jefferson and Monroe. I'm actually in the scene of, by the cornerstone, and I'm looking around at what existed. Uh, now, do I want to learn history that way, or do I want to go back to the Special Collections Library? Um, it's pretty self-evident, I think. I mean, it's not to say that you know, I'm a big fan of books and all the rest of it, so don't get me wrong. But it's just a, a representation of the kind of change that's, that's going to happen, probably in the kind of time, five-year time frame. It might, this, these are my opinions. Right? Uh, I'll give you another example from my own, own research that, came, that happened about, uh, well, now three years ago. This was, this was considered the breakthrough in science in, in 2021. So for those of you who remember high school biology, or maybe some of you are biologists, uh, we, we are composed of proteins. They're the building blocks of, of all life. Right? And a protein is a series of amino acids. So there's 20 little chemical entities that make up a protein, and there are usually 300 of them. So you can imagine a protein as beads on a string. Right? So you've got beads. So the protein's, your necklace is like 300 beads. And you've got 20 different colors. That's 20 to the 300 possibilities. That is more than all the atoms in the universe. <laughs> it's a huge, huge number. Right? But what we know is the number of proteins that actually exist in their three-dimensional shapes, which is so critical for understanding how biology works, how drugs work, how to design drugs, that, that number is much smaller. But we only until recently, I determined them experimentally. When I started doing this kind of work, it was a life's work to determine one of those structures. DeepMind, a company in London, that was actually next to where my son was at Industrial Light and Magic, and he overheard them talking about it in the pub, um, was which, that's totally irrelevant. Um, so they, they, were, they were a Google spin-off. About 30 of them developed an algorithm to actually predict. We've try, been trying to do this. This is the holy grail of molecular biology. We've been trying to do it for like 40, 50 years, including my own lab. These folks came along and solved, cracked the problem. As a result of that, we now have 214 million individual protein structures, which have profound impact on food production, energy pro production, uh, you know, uh, designing of drugs and so on. 
Well, I have old lectures about this, but to me, how this happened is not how we operate as a university. As a university, we all sit there in our little labs and we compete against each other. I'm sitting there writing a grant. My colleague down the corridor is writing a grant for the same program. And they're only going to fund like one in five anyway. And, we, you know, this is, this is, in my opinion, craziness. But that's how it works. That's how the system works. I, I've given up writing grants now. I just try and live on endowments. Um, <laughs> it's working pretty well so far. <laughs> but uh, that's not why I should have said that. So wipe that from the record. <laughs> and of course, the computing power to do this was beyond what's available in the university. So, you know, I had all the Google resources. But it's just an example in the scientific research of this kind of profound change. Right? All of this has consequences. So, and you, you know, you read about these just like I do. I mean, we already talked a little about the notion of job displacement. Clearly that happened, it goes back to the Luddites and, and, and that, that sort of thing with a, and it's, it, it's gone, this has all happened through the computer re revolution. Uh, there's decision-making bias, you read about this all the time in terms of things like facial recognition is biased in certain ways. Uh, you know, giving loans for, for houses is biased in certain ways and so on. And, and that's in part because the data itself is biased. But this is not a new problem. It's just a problem that's become more noticeable and profound as we've got more data and we're analyzing more data more quickly. An example of that is when I was at the NIH, suddenly we realized that we would, you know, there was a, there was a bias in thousands and thousands of, t of scientific papers and experiments because they'd all be done on male mice. I'm back, I'm back on mice again, sorry. Um, but because, for the, re for the reason that they didn't fight in the cages, like the, fe the fe whatever, don't get me wrong here, but the females used to fight more, which seems to be the wrong way around, but anyway, but anyway let's not go there. But, um, but clearly there was a bias because Clearly, the, the, the male makeup of the mouse is different than the female makeup in terms of hormone levels and all sorts of things. So suddenly, there was a realized there was a certain bias in that data. And this is just a, you know, an example. The whole notion of privacy, we can get into this. I'll, I'll say a little more about this because it was one of the questions. And then uh, the potential misuse more generally. And I think one of the other aspects of this is what we, we don't imagine. So an example would be, Years ago, this is another story. I was giving a talk with Tim Berners-Lee. Who knows who Tim Berners-Lee is? A couple, same people who, you know, same people who support, support Richmond. No. Um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee was responsible for inventing the internet. No, that's not true. He invented the World Wide Web. Um, Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> uh, so it started off just he created a protocol protocol called HTTP, which you see on a URL whenever you type something in. And, and it was really a means to connect documents together. And that's, he did that at CERN, which is a big physics accelerator in, that's in uh, Switzerland. And he did that to uh, really enable people to get access to documents. He had no idea. And then he wrote a browser to actually allow you to look at those documents. And that obviously took off big time. And, you know, we were talking about it, and he said, you know, I, ne you know, I knew it was a good thing, but I had no idea it would, it, would, it would grow like this. I think we had that conversation, uh, I don't know, late 90s maybe. And neither of us sat there at the lunch table. We thought it was a brilliant idea that suddenly everybody could have a voice on the internet. Everybody could post materials and all that. Well, that hasn't worked out so well. <laughs> I mean... We didn't even conceive of the notion of Facebook or any kind of social network. And so there are lots of things that happen out of these technologies that when they come about, you don't, you can't, you don't even conceive of. That's my point. And I, I suspect that's what's going on here as well in, in the things that are happening right now. So I think there'll be uh, new opportunities we've yet to realize, but there'll be obviously new threats as well. Got to give a plug for this. So I mentioned the, the history student, three presidents at the laying of the cornerstone. I'm out doing that. We're having four presidents 
next week. We're having four, there's a, a QR code there. You're more than welcome to come along to Old Cabell, uh, 3.30. We're going to have four presidents. Michael Crow is the president of Arizona State Unis University. Uh, Harriet Nemhard is the president of Harvey Mudd. Santa Ono is the president of University of Michigan. And I, I don't know who the guy on the end is, but <laughs> he's going to be there as well. Um, and they're going to have a discussion about the future of higher education uh, along the lines of the, the kind of things we've been talking about. So you know, if you're interested, come along. So that really takes us to your questions. Uh, I got a bunch of questions uh, that you, you provided uh, with a bit of help from Dali over there as well. Um, and I can get into that. But let me, let's, let's go at least do one or two from the audience if you... I'm sure you have them. Anybody? Any questions? And thank you for listening, by the way. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, Phil. Thank you for uh, My name's Steve Kugelmas. I'm a friend of the university. Um, I, I, was, I, I liked very much the, um, the idea that you presented about the changes that um, AI virtual reality would have with respect to learning that takes place at the university level. But I think of that as information consumption. The next slide that you talked about was about information production, but you hinted that that really was taking place in a larger context outside of the university research structure because of the, um, the underlying interdepartmental and intra internecine departmental competition, um, which also reflects back on the funding, the governmental funding structures. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on the information and knowledge production side of the university's future and how AI and, and if you think that there need to be governmental funding shifts or, you know, basically if you could expand on, on your thoughts on the information production side. I, I, let me have a go at it. I think this is what you're asking. It's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, it, this, is not, this is a very strange thing for a, de a dean to say, but in some ways I think higher ed is pretty broken. And, you know, I, and it's, not, it's not a criticism. UVA is a wonderful school. I really, I've been here seven years now. I really enjoy it. And, but, you know, it's a very siloed place. And other, in, NIH, when I was there, was an incredibly siloed place. And yet these breakthroughs are coming. The kind of thing I described to you with, you know, the crash data is that that's, you know, I have another example is, I don't want, I shouldn't get into it, but it, because it would take time. But, you know, I was at a water cooler effectively, actually like was in the kitchen upstairs, and I started talking to Terry Johnson, who's actually an economist in our school. And we came up with an idea around sustainability of data that just was, to me, was like mind blowing that, you know, I'm in part of a group, an international group looking at this in biology. And we, we, we never even thought of this idea. And it's actually a good idea. It was his idea. It com comes from an economist, right? So the fact, what, that's what we're trying to do here, is we have anthropologists, we have economists, we have historians. We've obviously got STEM people. So part of, the, I think, the answer to what you're asking is really, first of all, to be much more interdisciplinary. It's, this, it's nothing wrong with having disciplines, but I think we also need to have more opportunity to, uh, to, to cross-pollinate. And it's not clear that methods that we currently use, and someone asked the question about this, uh, it, are, are the most effective. And we're trying to measure that right now. Right? So I actually have a Jefferson Trust grant that's trying to look at, at how collaboration works, at least in, in the university. And then the other part of it is, is beyond the university, is that there's so much in this space around data that's not, you know, it, it's happening I just happened to read somewhere that Microsoft's valuation now is $3 trillion. So I just asked ChatGPT, what countries have a G GDP of $3 trillion? India, Germany. I mean, this, this is an incredible situation we find ourselves in, that these companies are more powerful, at least on paper in some way, than, than a number of governments. So, and they're, they're putting that money into becoming even more powerful. And, but they're also producing a lot of research. There's a, I think there's a lot of questioning about research in the, in the university framework as to how, you know, whether it's the most effective it could be. 
And, you know, I kind of tried to allude to that a little. Is that getting at what you're asking? No. Around the edges. We can talk more offline. It's just for the benefit of the, of the people in pajamas. Good morning. Uh, Kat McHugh, I work here at the University at the Batten School. Um, it seems like the genie's out of the bottle. And I'm wondering your perspective or the school's perspective on uh, some of the government efforts to try to at least constrain the genie to some degree. Like, what are your thoughts about that? And do you think it's a good thing, a bad thing? A, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. And I'm, you know, <laughs> it's not the first time it's been asked, of course. Um, I think just to step back, the way we think about what we're doing um, before we even get to is that we need to be training the next generation to be thinking about this in the right way. I've been stunned by going to, I've reviewed a number of uh, data science programs in various places around the country, and there are some of them that have no, no let's just, just it's, this is not the best word for it because it's much broader than this, but the ethics of, 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 of data science. They don't even have anything in their programs. Here, it's like one quarter of what we do, and it's not just about ethics, it's about justice and policy and law. And we have faculty we've hired to actually explore these things and to attempt to advise you know, governments and all of this. I mean, I, I do take a little heart in thinking that the response to AI has been much better in a shorter time frame. You can argue if it's still not short enough, relative to how we dealt with social networks. I don't think we dealt with the downsides of social networks, we being governments, dealt with the downsides of social networks anywhere near fast enough, and I don't think they actually have now. Uh, we seem to have slightly better handle on what, what's happening in, in AI, but still, you know, and I'd say in Europe, and it, of course it all goes back to the data, and who owns the data, who has the right to use it, and certainly in Europe, their you know, the, thinking and their policies and their laws are probably ahead of what we're doing here. So we still lag significantly. And the only answer I have for it and where I sit is to train students in the best possible way. So we have a model for data science, I won't go into it, but really at least one quarter of what we do and what we teach and what we research relates to the implications of what it is we're doing and rather than just doing it. And it's, it's very ingrained into the way we think. And I have to say that the history before, if you look at, for example, computer science and engineering, it's not clear to me that they really did such a good job with this. I don't necessarily mean here, but in general. Um, there's you know, the notion of engineering in society and computer science in society and the impact. That's, that's kind of a field of study, but it's not necessarily something that's ingrained into th everything that you, you actually learn and study. And, and, and you act, and you actually propose policies and things around it. So I think you know, there's an opportunity. It's not a criticism. It's just there's a new opportunity, and we need to do better. I, th I think your comparison to, of the universities to Kodak and Polaroid had a similar experience is interesting because the fundamental challenge they had was their business model, as you said, was based on a chemical with like 80 to 90 percent margins. So as they looked at digital, which eliminated that, basically eliminated their ability to make money. As you think about the analogy to the university, is there a parallel there in terms of, you know, is it the tuition? It's really, it's almost to me, it seems like the schools that are based on tuition are really deep trouble. The schools with huge endowments could keep going. So it seems like there's something around the economics here in addition to just the evolution of the Yeah, I know, you're hitting, you know, uh, yeah, you know, you're hitting my job here. <laughs> <laughs> we can't afford you anymore. Um, no, I mean, you're making a really good point. Demonetization was part of that, right? And so what you're referring to is really demonetization in the, in the higher education uh, or a different, a different business model, right, uh, I should say. And I, I'm actually a believer that that has to happen. And I think for me, this is something I'm working on right now, 
in the next phase of the school, the, the interrelationship between us and the private sector has to be there and it has to be strong. And it has to be done carefully. I'll give you an example, I've, you know, examples from my prior lives for how this uh, can go wrong. So the Scripps Institute of uh, Research, Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, which I was affiliated with at one point, they grew and grew and grew. NIH funding started going up, and they were growing like, and suddenly that funding dropped off. They just opened a facility in uh, in Florida, and you know they they couldn't afford it, so they ended up getting into a relationship with Novartis, a drug company. And the result of that was that some, they got to the point where researchers at Scripps could not publish a paper without having it approved by Novartis. So the, the notion of academic freedom, which you know, is something you don't want to fiddle with, uh, had, had, had gone away. We clearly can't go to those sort of extremes. But at the same time, there's so much benefit, uh, as I see it. And examples would be, we've got people, we actually use these people quite a bit within teaching in our own school, professors of practice. They're out there working in these sectors. They're on the cutting edge of some of these things. Students are going to go and get jobs in these kind of places. We need to be, they need to be interfacing with these kind of people. So how we, how, but we have to be careful how we do this, right? There's all sorts of issues around IP and, you know, all the rest of it. But I think we can do, it's not, it's not, and, you know, there are examples of where this has worked pretty well, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, places like the Broad Institute in Boston. So, you know, I think we're really starting to look at that in the next phase. And, um, you know, and I, I think there's some uh, support for it at the, within the leadership of the university. So that, that sort of starts to create a slightly, potentially a slightly different business model. But, you know, what, what you're describing is already happening because, you know, commu some community colleges, some universities that don't have such big endowments and big enrollments, they're, they're struggling. And, you know, that struggle is, is getting bigger. I used once gave, I once gave a lecture to a bunch of university presidents where, this was years ago, but it's sort of coming true, is that one day they're sitting there, you know, they open the Washington Post or whatever, the New York Times, and there's an article said, Google University opens. Yeah. Because that Google got fed up with the, the level of training that they're, of their, their hirees that are coming out of the university, so they start training them themselves. Yeah, you know, that's, and of course that would have its own set of, issues as well but you know it's a sort it was sort of a bit of wake up and call and that sort of thing is not quite happening but there's certainly you know if you look at the relationship between Amazon and Virginia Tech for example th these sort of things are you know are bubbling on the horizon and so I think as the university has to you, you can't turn your back on all of this I don't as strong as this place is I don't I don't I think this is my personal view is that uh, if we ignore this, it's not going to be good for the university. Thank you for your questions. I appreciate it. Uh, I noticed in uh, one of your slides, uh, one of the recent slides, where you talked about uh, biomedical researcher looking at different aspects. And one little two-word line in there was about energy production. I, I don't think that anybody that's looking at this if they're not looking at where energy and power are coming from to the university, in fact, while you're doing this, um, I think uh, you're going to have a, a supply and a demand issue. You're competing with the city, you're competing with the county, you're competing with the region for power. How much power is the intelligence campus that's being built on the north side of town going to demand and compete with the university, for instance? That's just up the road. If you look at what's going on in Northern Virginia right now with data center uh, production uh, building, which is the most um, significant anywhere in the world right now, the problems that they're having with planning for this infrastructure is really impacting the data centers that are going to be available. So I think that's one of the things that the president's probably ought to consider as you go through your slides is where's the energy going to come from and when is it going to be here? Yeah, no, I, the, the slide was meant to reflect that 
um, and I didn't say anything about it, so thanks for pointing it out. Uh, just to be clear, the, the notion of what was achieved scientifically um, has protein, affects protein synthesis, which then affects potentially energy production from biofuels. But that's not obviously what you're getting at. You're getting at the, the energy consumption. From what, and yeah, it's a huge problem. We only got to look at what you know, companies like Meta, and, you know, they're, they're moving and building, starting to build data centers on top of thermal, uh, you know, so they can use geothermal energy and all, all this kind of stuff. There, there's, there's definitely a very significant shortfall here as, it's, as it stands right now. There's a lot of research going in to actually reducing the power consumption uh, across these data centers. But, you know, I don't study this personally, and we, we don't actually have anyone uh, in the school, but clearly just the, well, there's not environmental impact as well, obviously. But uh, th it's clearly a huge issue. And it, it, it's gonna, it's, it is, it will come back to haunt us. It's not, I think you're, you're absolutely right in saying. So. Uh, my name is George Casper. I'm a friend of the university. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the data that these that's being analyzed um, continues to grow. So one would assume that the results that you get then are going to be more accurate. Um, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, um, we could, we could talk. Yeah, is that your question, or is that no? That's <laughs> that's an that's an that's sort of just an observation. Um, so one question is, you know, where is that threshold? And secondly, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but so this is based on the data that's in there, which gives you, I'll use old fashioned words, causation. It doesn't give you causation, it gives you correlation. So you've got to then go back, I assume as a scientist and figure out for some of these questions, what's the causation here? All I have is a correlation, and that, that might be totally misleading. Yeah. So a couple of things you, you pointed out there. So it relates to points that others had asked as well, so I'll try and roll it in. Um, I mean, first, the last part, the sort of correlation versus causation, I think, in a, in a general term, it's, it's really more about the notion of the human in the loop in, in, in this kind of analysis, right? So there's no, there's no question that these are tools that have value, but are they valuable in their own right or are they valuable within some virtuous cycle with humans in it? And I've written about this recently. I did a, um, and just a, this is a silly example, but I'll tell you anyway, because I had so much fun doing it is I just, I just after the graduation, this is becoming an annual thing, after graduation, the, as soon as I hand out that last degree, I get on my motorcycle and I start riding somewhere. So I did a big circular ride around the west, uh, the west side of uh, the Rockies and the eastern side of the Sierra. So I did a loop. And I'm doing that with a friend of mine. And as we're doing it, I'm following him days, you know, also incredible. We live in such a beautiful country. And when I got back, I'm starting to think, you know, could I, could I have put on a virtual headset and simulated that? <laughs> and I'm thinking, absolutely not, all right? So the, there's, I could have actually probably got something out of it that would have been useful on my trip, but it wouldn't change, you know. This is someone, I, he and I made some interesting scientific, I would say discoveries, work we did years ago and I've known him for years, and, and it, we're just so different. And it's like, and I'm just rambling on about this, sorry. But, so he's so ordered, right? We get off our motorcycles, he gets his things out, he puts them on the, gets the tent out, it's like everything's shaped like that. I just throw everything out. <laughs> and it's like, we were like that when we did science 40, 50, 40, 50 years ago, right? And the, the, the synergy we had together, and I'm thinking, how would I have cap there's no way you capture that in some kind of a virtual environment, not, not in the foreseeable future. Just relationships between humans, uh, it, it's, you know, it, 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 these tools are an assist, but it's like the, the value is when you use them in conjunction with human thought. And, you know, going back to sort of the, the first part of it, just to illustrate, who's familiar with the game Go? 
Same people. That put up to <laughs> I, is it Tuesday? <laughs> uh, so, so Go is a game that's very complicated. There are more moves in Go. Here we go again. There's more moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. Right? Uh, it's a game with you play with stones on a board. Right? The, the writing was on the wall before we got to large language models and that. That uh, the, uh, folks uh, again at DeepMind had AlphaGo. Uh, they created a version, a, a model to simulate the game. It was trained on human role playing, and it beat the world's Go champion four games to one in a in a competition. He gave up at that point, which was a mistake, because what happened subsequently. I mean, it was an incredible event, and it was, it was really interesting. There's a, there's a YouTube, uh, actually, documentary that's worth watching about this. Because when the geeks, the programmers who done built this model, actually saw that it was more powerful than any human, it was better at the game than any human on the planet, even they were disquieted by, by the whole thing. And then it, you know, it just got better and better. The second version of, the, of, of it was trained not on human Go playing, it was trained on the first version that, uh, the, the, they, the, the, the first version of the program or the model had actually produced. So there was no human in the loop at that point. And to me, that sort of thing is pretty scary. And then just about, I don't know, a year or two ago, this happened in 2017, so about a year or more ago, it turns out that a human figured out how to beat it because there were flaws in the methodology that they actually determined. So there's this iteration between human and machine, if you like, that you know, is, is kind of interesting, and it's sort of where we're, where we're headed. But there's just, I just don't see any way in, you know, people ask, well, when's this, you know, when's this going to overtake humans? And you ask 20 experts, you get 20 answers that range from five years to 5,000 years. So I'm, I'm, I don't know where I am, but I'm not in the five-year range. But I am in the five-year range as it relates to some of the things that are going to affect higher ed. Uh, and we're trying to embrace that in the school. So I think we probably, do we need to end? Uh, you're probably getting bored to death, so I, I do not want to bore you. speaking with us today. We have a small um, token of our appreciation. Um, on behalf of the Lifetime Learning Program and the Alumni Association, thank you all for coming out and joining us online. Uh, we have recorded this talk and we'll be um, posting that to our podcast library. Podcast, podcast library. Um, you can join us on Facebook and get notifications about that there. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us on the tour next. Um, we've got several student ambassadors that will kind of point out some of the key um, points of interest. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I just say one, a couple of other things. Uh, Stephanie Fentress is here, who is our... She... No. She... Ah, there she is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, there she is. She's uh, our director of development. She would love to, love to talk to you. Um, and, and then just about the human in the loop, I just wanted to tell you uh, just one thing. On, as you walk up the stairs to the second floor, you'll see what says admin suite. You can't actually go in there. There's just lots of secrets in there. Uh, actually, it's, it's, the interesting thing in there is my office is in there, and when I bought Jim Ryan uh, and Ian Balcom, the provost, independently to look at the, uh, uh, this was before the building was finished, and I showed them my office, the first thing they said, the next dean is going to knock that wall out and make it, make it much bigger. But as you walk up there, that was supposed to be funny, sorry. Um, <laughs> as you walk up there, there is a model uh, that's sitting on a chair in that, you can't touch it, no one, because it's very fragile. But it was made by my daughter-in-law. It's quite emotional, actually. They gave it to me uh, when the building opened. And it shows you what the human can do. So, have a look. Great, yes. And uh, we've got a few pastries and coffee left, so grab some, some of those snacks on your way out. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> we have one.
wonderful ambassadors to show you around the building. I like your t-shirt. <laughs>